Losing all sight uh, unexpectedly in surgery three years ago was quite a life-changing experience. Losing all sight as an architect was potentially a career killer. I wasn't so convinced. But then again, who had ever heard of such a thing? Blind architect. In my six years of education and 20 years of professional practice, I'd never met, read of, or heard of a blind architect. My blind rehabilitation counselors had never worked with one. Their inquiries out into the network came out empty. I even called the American Institute of Architects, explained the situation, and asked if they knew of any blind architects. It was a really awkward silence. I uh, never got an answer. So, it seems that the only one I could come up with is someone, it, apparently he's done a lot of work. And, and maybe you've come across him as well, because as you go down the street and you'll see somebody look out across the street to the new, new art museum or something, saying, oh my God, the architect must have been blind. So, so he's out there and he's done a lot of work. <clears throat> but that wasn't me. <laughs> uh, eventually I did find some. Uh, there's a blind architect practicing in Lisbon, Portugal, and actually one here in Chicago, but it took me a while to find them. Uh, but clearly, there were going to be no books on how to be, be a blind architect. And I figured if I was going to figure it out, I need to get back to the office and, and figure it out on the fly. So exactly one month after losing my sight in surgery, I went back to the office and started going, figuring it out. Um, it, was, it wasn't that difficult, you know. Everything else was still perfectly good. Uh, I just lost my sight. It was in good shape. And I even suspected that things were even better because my wife had a sidebar conversation with the doctors and suggested that while they're in there for brain surgery, maybe they can install a few upgrades and fix a few things. <laughs> so I was pretty confident, but yeah, there are some, some serious questions. But one thing I knew is that there was an awful lot in architecture that wasn't visual. Most of us think of architecture being a heroically visual profession. It is, but there's an awful lot that isn't. There's a lot of information, specification, regulation, all sorts of fun stuff. There are contracts, fee spreads, billings, all sorts of good things. But I like doing all that in the creative side of things. So it wasn't so much could I stay an architect, but could I stay an architect that engaged in the full uh, spectrum of the work. So meanwhile, I was, uh, as work was picking up, uh, I was going about my rehabilitation training and learning how to get around, uh, do things around the house, get around the, the community, get through the town, uh, operate the computer, operate cell phones, was learning all sorts of new non-visual ways to do things that I always assumed required sight. That gave me all sorts of, of confidence to think, well, you know, maybe there are some ways. Maybe there's some ways that we can that I can do architecture without sight and be on the creative side and do some of the visual things. So the real question is then, how do I see a drawing? How do I draw? And then if I can do all that, then where's the value? What can I do with that? Where are the possibilities? Let's see, do we have advancement here? Yeah. Okay, computer slow. Okay. Um, so one thing I realized was that, that the creative process was actually an intellectual process. The hand doesn't know what to draw simply so because it wants to draw. It's the connection between the mind and the hand. It's an intellectual process. So if I couldn't see what I was drawing anymore, were there other ways that I could do that? Were there some non-visual techniques that I could use to express the thoughts that I might have and also to understand the things out there in the world that I'm dealing with? So, again, is how can I read drawings? How can I, um, how can I uh, draw? And then what other possibilities might be out there? Sorry, I got ahead of myself. So, um, along the way, uh, this was not too long ago, uh, and the company I was with was, was grinding down under the pressure of the, of the economy late in 2008. I started 2009 looking for new work. Uh, like millions of Americans, I was out of, out of work. Only, I was an architect and I had been blind for less than a year. Not a great place to start the new year. But quickly I was introduced to a group uh, called the, the Design Partnership in San Francisco 
and they were working with the Smith, with the Smith Group uh, for a, uh, doing a, a new polytrauma and blind rehabilitation center for the VA in Palo Alto, California. I was looking for work, and what I found was a whole new career, a whole new opportunity. Because what I didn't realize was in this context, all of a sudden, my new disability gave me great abilities. It gave me new insights. It gave me new value. Because architects, they know nothing about how the blind use space. They know nothing about how we move through buildings. It was new territory for them. We don't study that in school. It doesn't happen. We have very little exposure to that. So all of a sudden, there was great value from the client and from the other architects that I was blind. And I was even new to blindness. So within, just like that, my new disability was turned on its head. And then I started realizing, huh, I imagine there are other possibilities out there. Um, so I started thinking about what those might be. So with that, there's, I realized there are schools for the blind, uh, other rehabilitation centers for the blind, there are service providers for the blind, and then something I didn't expect uh, was some things in the healthcare industry. Uh, ophthalmology clinics and eye centers. And it was all wonderful, because these were all buildings that were purpose-built for people with visual impairments. And I was one of the few architects out there that had experience with that. And I got to use my new experiences to bring meaning to, to architecture and where I had real value, where I thought perhaps people would wonder where it was. And then I also started to, whoop, kind of hit on myself. Uh, must have been hitting keys, I didn't notice it. Somebody tell me where what slides up. I'm sorry, say it again. Printing process. Printing process. I'm way ahead of myself. Okay. I've been really hitting keys. Um, so uh, other projects that might be po uh, possible included transit centers. Probably didn't think about it, but this is something that's really critical to the blind, but very challenging to them. So if you're blind, you can't drive. They don't let you drive. <laughs> um, so we're, we're committed, you know, mass transit users. Uh, but none of the transit centers are designed with that in mind. In fact, if you do everything that's required by ADA, it'll be of little help to the visually impaired in a, in a transit center in most buildings. So that's a good area. And then also museums. So we're trying to make museums more accessible to people. But we don't go to museums to go through them. We actually go there to access the content. So how do we do that for the visually impaired? Not just for the content, but how do we create a visual experience uh, a museum experience for a, for a non-visual uh, visitor. So, uh, I am so far out of whack here with my screen. Uh, so, um, I'm gonna just jump ahead to where we are. And that's, how do, I, how, do I, how do I draw? And I don't have any idea how I got here. So, <laughs> uh, so how do I, do, uh, well, I'll start with the drawing. And that was up earlier. Uh, how, do, how do I see drawings? Uh, that was actually turned out to be pretty easy. Uh, there's lots of technology out there now, and I'm lucky to have this has happened when it did. Uh, embossing printers. Uh, it's quite simple. The people that I'm working with send me their drawings as a PDF. They're just working on their CAD programs, write a PDF, email it to me. I send it through my printer, and then I can feel it uh, with my fingertips. Now, reading, reading a drawing with your fingers is very different than reading it with your eyes. Uh, if you look at a drawing, uh, you see the hole and you drill into the parts. You start to recognize the details and, you, and sort of, you understand all the details relative to the hole. In seeing a drawing with your fingertips, you're finding the detail and trying to figure out what the hole is, what the entirety is. So it's, a, it's an inverted process. And to pick up a drawing on, in the raw just on yourself, it's, it's pretty rough sometimes. Uh, so it helps to have some explanation. Uh, but it works pretty well. Uh, and one thing I discovered is, although there's some disadvantages to it, there's actually a pretty amazing advantage to it. And that's when I'm reading a drawing with my fingers, especially the plans, that I actually start to feel like I'm in the building. I didn't have that relationship visually with a drawing. When I feel, when I go through the building with feeling it with my fingertips, it's like I'm actually there. And I'm imagining the space that's surrounding me. I imagine what it sounds like. I imagine what, what the material at the floor feels like and how it sounds as I walk across it. And I start to imagine what it took me to get there, what I, how I remember the space around me, and how I'm going to know where I'm going to try to head off to at that point. Now, you may not need to do that visually, but if I'm doing a building for, for someone who's, who's blind, that's a pretty important thing to do, because that's what you're trying to anticipate 
is how that all comes together. Uh, so that it's a fantastic experience with a, with the uh, with feeling the drawings that way. And I believe I have the how do I draw up now with right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then we actually learned that we could add Braille to it by uh, loading up Braille fonts into the CAD programs. And the people that I'm working with, they just grab, the, duplicate the text that I need, um, create my own profile, grab the font. They don't understand Braille, but it's there. And they put it in the, uh, leave it there in the drawing and send me the drawing, and it, it works really well. Uh, and one an unexpected uh, benefit of that was that uh, as I started working with uh, with clients and users that were blind, then all of a sudden I had all the tools they needed to understand what was going on. And without that, they're sitting there wondering, trying to understand, having having audible version of the visual presentation and trying to understand what it is you're presenting to them. It's very hard. And if any of you have ever sat in a presentation with an architect with their drawings and have them explain it, was that kind of tedious, difficult, boring? Try it with your eyes closed. How, how soon do you fall asleep or get frustrated and get up and walk away? Uh, so this is great to be able, in the context of bringing people together, to think, realize that this is a, a way of bringing the blind into a design process that typically they'd have a hard time accessing. So I can read a drawing, but I'm an architect. I want to draw. How do I draw? That's a hard one. And it came to me as a surprise. I, I volunteered as a mentor for the National Federation of the Blind Youth, Youth Slam that offers a STEM, uh, a STEM uh, experience uh, on campus uh, for blind high school students from around the country. This is at the University of Maryland College Park campus. And they had 150, 150 blind students. 15 of them participated in an architecture class. It was great. And I got to participate in that. And it's just like any other orientation, uh, you know, introduction to architecture class for high school students, only they were all blind. And it was re remarkable. They learned about history, philosophy, all sorts of things about architecture. And they designed a house. And they built program models and scale models. And they learned how to do all that. And to draw, they were given wax sticks. There's a kid's thing. You get these wax sticks. You can bend and curve them, stick them together. And, and it's, it's really great because you, you don't need tape, scissors, glue. You know, just everything's right there in your fingertips, and they stick together. They also stick to paper. So with that, I realized I could draw on top of the embossed drawings. And that was a great way for me to participate in the process in the office with the people I was working with. Because actually, they just take their work and say, well, how about this? We got a problem here, how about let's, let's try this kind of thing. You could draw, do things from scratch, just, or sketch on top of, of things. So that worked really well. Uh, so, but I can't input that information into the computer, at least not at this point. Maybe one day they'll, they'll figure that out. But at this point, I can rely on others. And quite frankly, we're, you work in, this, in a team setting, so we always work to someone's strengths. And clearly, others are going to be a, a better uh, cat jockey than I'm going to be. So. so if all that works, and I can draw, then, then uh, this is where I got ahead of myself. Then, then why the heck, why would somebody hire a blind architect? So I've already been through this part. <laughs> so this was uh, the opportunity to work with the uh, polytrauma, uh, work on the Polytrauma and Blind Rehab Center for the VA uh, in, uh, in, in Palo Alto, California. I'll skim through here. Uh, Projects for the Blind. Okay, sorry about that. So then, in thinking about those projects, uh, some projects for the blind or projects that are, are critical to yet challenging for the blind, you know, I sometimes I wonder, is that, am I limiting myself? Is that all that I can do? I don't think that's the question, uh, the, the, the real issue. I think there's plenty that, it, that can be done as an architect without sight, and I think there's some very unique uh, insights that one gets uh, from this different perspective. But I do believe that it gives great strategy for, getting, uh, for, for, for working in a competitive market, marketplace. So, architecture beyond sight. At this point, I've gotten really comfortable with the idea of uh, architecture without sight. And I'm actually pretty excited about it. I'm more excited about architecture than I've been in years. It's a little odd, but 
it, it works really well. And the things that I, would, that I really get interested in now are not the visual things. For the first 20 some years of my career, it was all about the visual. And now I'm really interested in how space sounds, how it feels, um, and how, you know, even how it smells. Um, so, but it's, it is a different operation. And these scenes are harder to draw. Um, let's see. So what I am re really interested in is how to design these things that take other senses besides just sight. Oh, we're getting really close to the end of time here. So I'm going to move forward. So, so how do we do that? Uh, here's one quick example. The Campbell Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas. It's really interesting because I, I wanted to go there to hear the building. This is a very distinctive space. I knew it well and never went there. So I went there without sight last, last winter. I couldn't hear anything. They had great acoustic engineers and they deadened the whole thing. But what I discovered was that there were some things he did visually that worked really good centrally. And that's, you might notice in the photograph, there's some bands in the, there's a wood floor with travertine uh, wood, uh, travertine uh, stone bands which actually it marked up the space visually very well, but also worked very well uh, underfoot for someone who was blind. You could feel it with a cane, and you could start to understand space that way. And unfortunately, I'm gonna skip on because what I really wanna talk about is coming up here. And I'm gonna just skim right on through because I only have two minutes. So, uh, I'm not sure what's up. It, so, he's coming up with sonic guidance. One thing I started working with was the real potential of acoustics in design and architecture. And, and in this space, I started exploring with how someone who was blind and couldn't see a space and was new to sight loss could understand how to get down the middle of a space uh, without going off to the sides and getting lost uh, using sound and using natural sound. And so we used the bridge overhead as an acoustic uh, system to really f focus the sound so that if you're underneath it, you knew where you were. If you went off to the sides, it sounded completely different. So it started developing a system for the blind to get across that space. And that opened up a whole new way of thinking that I'm just gonna dive forward into because I'm, I'm out of time. And that's the idea of modeling acoustics in a building, uh, working together with uh, Arab engineers in San Francisco who have a fantastic sound lab and have developed a system for modeling sound in a building, whether it's a music hall uh, or any kind of building. And it's a real life uh, mo uh, rendering of that space based on the digital model. And although they developed it for music halls, what I challenged them to do was I wanted to find out what it would sound like for me to tap my cane in a building that was being designed. And they said, well, maybe. And, they said, and then furthermore, if everybody else does walkthroughs through the building, I want to hear what it sounds to tap through a building. Because then I want to be able to hear what all the different spaces sound like. And I want to start understanding the structures to the building so that if you're blind, you can understand where you are in the building based on how it sounds. And you might understand the sequencing of things. Now, this is maybe specifically for, you know, understanding space if you're blind. But I also think it's interesting because it's taking acoustics away from perfecting sound in that particular space as a music hall or separating sound from one space to another it's saying sound can be an active part of the design of, of space. And so it's not just, you know, it's not just uh, what it, you know, the perfection of that kind of degree, it's just about adding to the character of space. And unfortunately, I'm way beyond my time, so I'm gonna have to stop it there. Thank you. <laughs>